Hello. We're recording. Okay, we are live. And um, welcome to part two to the 48 Laws of Strategy and Marketing. This is your host, Terry Wilburn. I want to share with you um, a little something before we get started. This whole course is about simply you understanding how to uh, get into the mix of your professional life. You need to understand that uh, making music, professionally at least, is going to be about one simple thing and one thing only, and that is to make a profit off of your efforts. Um, you also need to understand that if that is something that you're not interested in, if you're doing it just for a hobby, um, then you're in the wrong place. Uh, this is, of course, about having a, a great hobby. Hobby, uh, by all means, you know, music is my hobby. Uh, but it went from uh, from a amateur's perspective of, hey, I could do this to turn it into a profession, and then it became a hobby. So I always did music from the perspective of that I want to get paid from my, my summer, from what I put together, um, whether it be a mixtape or a... Uh, slow dance or or fixing somebody's audio, if I'm playing a song, if I'm singing or rapping or dancing or writing writing something, I want to get paid for it. And um, the celebrities do, why don't I? And so this, all of these talks will be coming from that perspective. And like I said, if that's something you're not uh, feeling comfortable with at this point in time, feel free to send me a message and I'll opt you out. And um, you could have your money back. But for those who want to go further, and if I'm right about you, you're one of those type of people that has had enough of uh, sitting on the couch doing nothing all day long but dreaming. If you want to put some action behind your dreams and some uh, focus into your actions, then you're in the right place because I want to reveal one thing with you today, and that is this, that knowing how to market your music is going to take you to another level. It's going to uh, give you status that you never thought you could have. In fact, you may have always kind of hinted it that you could have this kind of status, but now you'll know for sure uh, once you've shown these things out of this course. Yes, and um, if you'd like to stay inside of this course and uh, learn more, then feel free to do so. Otherwise, uh, just shoot me a message and say, hey, Terry, thanks but no thanks, all right? So anyhow, for us, um, we'll be beginning today, you and I, we'll be starting to talk about um, part two of marketing, the 48 Laws. And so today I would like to discuss with you um, the beginnings of your marketing plan. And before we do that, I have to cover a couple of bases first. Something that's going to save you time, it's going to save you money, it's going to save you some heartache. <laughs> and I say some, it won't save you all, of course. 
you, it'll save you some heartache. And uh, believe me, some is better than none, because that some might actually cause your, your heart to fail, you know. And uh, it's been times in my life when I was a little younger <clears throat> that I found out that people will abandon you very quickly. In fact, um, you'll think they have your back, and then they just flat out won't. So a big part of your your marketing plan, before we even get into that, you should be knowing, uh, and I didn't say that right, you should be knowing already uh, who you are as a person, the type of thing that you will and will not stand for, uh, your ethical and integrity levels. And I do say levels because there is all level. My integrity may be higher than yours, yours your character uh, may be higher than mine. Although I think I'm a very round person, I would give myself on a... If I had to give myself a judgment, which I, I, I scarcely do, but if I just had to throw myself out there, and um, uh, they used to have a a dating app a long time ago, back in the days of uh, MySpace. Um, they had a dating app, and uh, you'd post your picture and the picture would say whether you're a hot or not or something like that. It would rate you like from a scale of 1 to 10. And a lot of times, uh, like random people would rate your photo. They'd show men to men. And, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, your, your, your sexuality or nothing about it. I'm talking about if you're a straight female, they'd show you to a straight male, you know. Or if you're a straight female, they'd show you to... Um, both man and female, so it was kind of odd. Uh, and anyhow, uh, they reach you from a scale from 1 to 10. And a lot of times, no one got a per 10 because random people, would you see like 30,000, it was before Facebook, long before Facebook came along, uh, at least on a, 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 a mainstream platform. I know it was done in college or at the University of uh, I think Harvard, I believe. <laughs> or Yale or something like that. Anyhow, uh, that was a private um, platform. But now it's, uh, it's during that time, it was, this was an open thing, and uh, people would rate you from 1 to 10 on whether you're hot or not, and rarely anyone, even the most cutest of the people and most hottest, sexiest people on the planet, they rarely got 9s or 10s. Um, because, you know, you would see like 30,000 people rated the, the photo, and so out of that 30,000, you know, you're going to get some, some haters, you know, <laughs> people are not, everybody's not going to like you, and uh, let's just say, you know, if you're showing a, a straight guy to a straight, another straight guy and asking him, hey, what, how do you think this guy is on a 1 in 10, uh, and he rates you a, a 0 or a 4, you know, just because he's not attracted to males, you know, that's going to hurt your status. And so a big thing is, uh, and so that, that platform went under, I think it went under, maybe, I don't know, I haven't been on a dating app in 15 years, I don't know. Maybe it's around doing the, the biggest thing, maybe it's what turned into uh, Tinder or something, I have no idea. Uh, but I have no idea about dating, dating apps, it's not my stuff to <laughs> go talk to my friend, uh, Evan Pagan. I think he's a uh, dating master, or he, he was at one point in time. Anyhow, um, go see him. So what I'm saying to you is this, is uh, you have to know your, your status. You have to know where you are in life. You can't be seen on the wrong platforms. Let me break that down to you. I'll give you a story, for example. This is a real-life example. Uh, unless during the point, uh, this, this is the bonus part of this course, but during the course or during any part of the course, including the bonus tips, including the, uh, the PDF, or if you receive the actual physical manual, however you receive this material, because it will be, be branched out in different ways among the inner circle, among the mastermind, among... Um, uh, uh, Facebook um, and uh, some parts of video on Instagram, uh, uh, whether you receive it in a mail or on um, 
Uh, how have you received it uh, digitally? It will be branched out different ways according to your particular uh, status within the, the Music Academy Society. Uh, we know that if you're inside of this teaching, you got it because you're a part of the society. Okay? And um, you are established as a righteous member. That means that you're a level one uh, entry and you have access to certain files. Uh, other than that, you have to ascend the level <coughs> to a master or a grandmaster uh, to receive certain type of files and get that kind of information. But this particular uh, information is branched out on all levels. So uh, you're getting the crim de la crim, okay, or the top rank or the top cut of um, uh, marketing info. And so there are deeper levels, and we'll go through that in, uh, in another part, uh, maybe part three, maybe a little bit down the road on how uh, to market yourself. But first, let's back up and cover our bases. We just say that you can't be on the wrong uh, platform. So all the stories that I'll give you will be real-life examples unless I otherwise state that they are. And a lot of times they are anyway. I'm just changing the names, okay? I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, uh, but I will from time to time call real names and people out just because I can do that. Um, regardless of whatever they had to say about it, uh, not to defame anyone because I don't do that, but if I find myself present in your experience that I have given my info, my, my, uh, my, I have lend, lended you my status, uh, lended you a helping hand, and I took part of what took place uh, at the event, I believe I have a perspective and I have a right to tell uh, my students what's going on uh, in the real world. So from time to time, I will call real names and real situations out. Uh, other than that, I'll probably change the names. But this particular, uh, uh, likely 9 out of 10 of the, or at least 8 out of 10 of the things that we'll be speaking about will be non-hypothetical. What that means is that there will be real-life examples of things that have happened during uh, the marketing process or uh, the production process um, that help someone or cause someone to be defeated in their um, in their in their business as uh, independent. I will not be covering a lot of uh, major uh, uh, major artists or major labels for one particular reason, and if that is this, and I'll be using a lot of independent um, indie major names and figures or just straight independent uh, solopreneurs like myself uh, with real life examples uh, for one reason and that is this, is that, is that <clears throat> you need to know the truth about what matters most to you, how you're going to start making money, how you're going to uh, adapt, how you're going to work this plan for yourself and you need real life people who you can relate to, who you can contact to, who you can find on Facebook, who you can find on um, uh, things like SCORE to help um, uh, get you to the place where you need to be that's going to sh shift you, so to speak, into a new atmosphere, into a new dynamic, into a new uh, uh, way of looking at your own life and your own style and your own way of doing things. And so you can't relate to someone that's on the big screen per se, not as a, a career status, because you yourself have not been on the big screen. Now, you may have had some uh, ups and downs or some uh, trials and tribulations in your business, uh, your uh, affair as a uh, musician or an artist or engineer or producer our manager, there are several types of people who are taking this course. Uh, you fall somewhere within that handful of people. Maybe you're a producer, like I said, uh, which which really means a lot of different things. We'll get into those topics a little later on down in uh, the marketing tips uh, and the 48 Law of strategy, strategy. Mostly we'll be talking about like rebranding and things of that nature when we're talking about 
uh, the positions. But as I mentioned to you in a previous message that you received, you need to go back and check those messages, like I said, because they have some vital information in there. Uh, or just scan through some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the PDFs to see the topics that we're talking about uh, so you can kind of catch up if you miss anything. But I hope you're not listening to this out of sequence. Now, if you've um, taken the whole course, you want to just go do a refresher, that's fine. You can bounce around like that. You know, At least you know what you're looking for. Um, but hopefully you're taking the time, hopefully you're taking the time to um, uh, go through each step by step and not just saying, oh, I want to, hey, there goes how to shoot a video or how to uh, produce a song. Or, hey, there goes how to get a great mix or blend or, or master. Don't do that for uh, one simple reason is that you're going to throw yourself off. Yeah, you might have the skills to mix, but you won't understand uh, the dynamics of what you're doing. Because I can tell you something, um, and I'll, I'll be throwing the secrets of the top 40 billboard in this course for free, and they'll be kind of spread out all over the place. I might let you know from time to time, hey, here's a clue, here's a clue number two, here's whatever. Um, It'll be structured like that because it's teaching you a, a well-rounded um, lesson plan on how you need to go about structuring your home studio, uh, home recording studio uh, business. And I keep saying business because this is. here anyhow so um, it's structured in a way because I keep saying business because it's structured in a way that's going to uh, help develop you into a more real well-rounded uh, 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 specialist and what I mean by specialist is that if you're right now in the midst of saying hey I'm just starting I'd like to um, get to know the studio, you'll understand much greater than those who have had five, six months or maybe even years within music recording or, or defining themselves as artists. Here's why. It's because if you're just starting, you're just like a brand new baby. And you can learn how to talk, walk, and someone can help develop you much quicker and far easier than someone who's already saying, hey, I'm an engineer, hey, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a musician, hey, I'm a producer, hey, this and that, this and that, because um, not because that person can't be taught anything, but mostly because that person already has a specialty in what they're doing, and whether they're wrong or whether they're right, they typically don't want to see um, anyone um, uh, change the rules of the, of the laws about how they go about doing things, which could be totally wrong. And I'll just be honest, if you're calling yourself a producer or an a engineer or a manager or any of, none of these things, an artist, whether it be a rapper or a singer, excuse me, if you find me, um, if you find me, um, Pausing for long moments, I'm getting calls all over the place. I don't know why my iPhone keeps letting calls through like that, uh, but I'm recording this on the fly while I'm traveling. And so, anyhow, uh, where were we? You're getting a lot of um, people who have already decided in their mind what they want to do, where they want to go, and how they want to go about it. And someone comes along to re try to reshape their mind reshape their, their form of thinking and um, reshapes their, their reshapes their, their what they do they're not going to like that very much but if you're already calling yourself uh, Mr. or Mrs. X and this is what you do, and you're not seeing the results that you need to, what you need to do is stay tuned to this course, go step-by-step step with us, 
And what I mean by us is that it's me and you. And um, you're in a group of small individuals. Not, oh, excuse me, a small, small individuals. That's funny. I don't do that to show a little house. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean no offense against small people. Okay? I'm a very tall person. Everybody's small to me. <laughs> but what I mean is this is a small group of individuals uh, who are dedicated to uh, helping you out. So you can reach out at any time to some of the people within this course, within the Facebook, uh, within um, uh, the live calls, etc. So that's what I mean. Stay tuned with us because you're, you're doing this. It's me and you. Uh, but there's also other people who are taking parts of the course or, or a little bit ahead of you or maybe a, a little bit behind you who you can help out as well. And they can kind of refine you and you can help refine them and you can all kind of what they call cross pollinization. You can take a little bit from them and they can take a little bit from you and it'll help you grow and you can help them uh, to start growing. And so that's what I mean by that. So if you're an artist, let's just say if you're a female singer uh, and you want to uh, cut a demo or extend your range or something like that, <clears throat> then you can do so. Uh, but you have to know with what uh, intensity you want to try to do that, um, how you want to do that, why you want to do that, etc. Um, because that will help further develop your career as an artist um, if you knew how to market yourself, if you knew how to... Um, you know, since we, let's just stay on top of the market. Let's not go straight too far because I don't want to confuse you. Um, but you would have a more definitive range into your artistry. You wouldn't have to work as hard. I can tell you that much right now. Excuse me. Is that if you're a producer or an act, um, not an actor, but a singer, or even an actor, but an artist, if you're in the entertainment industry in some kind of way or you're trying to be having a more refined um, value of what you're doing and why you're doing it is going to shoot you further uh, than you even planned on going just because of the propensity, the, 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 the buildup of inertia, the, the energy that is within you and the knowledge that's within you, you'll shortcut time. And what I mean by that is that you won't spend a lot of time trading your wheels and uh, spinning your wheels in one place, you'll actually go about doing your daily business. You see? So here's the point to all of that, is that um, here, here's a particular story about being on the wrong platform. Um, there was, uh, this is 2010-ish, you know, it was like the beginning of the decade that just ended, and I do say just ended because this new one just started, this, this is 2020 uh, decade. So it just started now. So, you know, whether you find yourself listening to this at whatever point in time, this is a brand new decade. Like, this is an old material, okay? I can give you updates on anything <laughs> that's going on in the world right now. All right? This is, this is new material. So what I'm saying to you is that pay close attention to what I'm about to tell you. Um, with this story especially, um, and see how many nuggets you can pull out of this. Uh, being on the wrong platform, this was a uh, an artist I know or, uh, at the time. They are no longer an artist, um, and here's why. Is that uh, this particular person, I won't call their name, uh, but they had a group um, that was 
that was a um, um, they were bedroom studio producers. I'll put it like that, and they made fairly uh, good music. You know, I wouldn't say it was great music, but I mean, uh, if they made ten songs, you could probably pick one that you might. Uh, buy from them, or you can probably listen to it a couple of times before you got rid of it. Or, you know, they had potential to become someone, I won't say great, but they had a potential to be, you know, like the local artist or whatever, maybe get played on the radio or something like that. If they only just followed uh, the particular things that I was saying to them to do. And so I would come over and stop over uh, from time to time at the studio just to check on them. And during the time I was there, and I, I was this was this was someone uh, who was close to um, uh, my wife at the time. And so I would stop um, stop over to see how they were doing uh, in their projects because when they when I first met them, or should I say they were first introduced to me, I was already a producer. I had already been on, um, uh, what was I doing at the time? Yeah, I had already been on uh, television. I had already had tracks. I had already done a lot of stuff. I wasn't big. I was, I had, didn't have a big name or anything. And I hadn't started to make a lot of money, uh, but I made, I, you know, I made it, made it trickle a little bit. A lot of people say they make it rain, but I made, I made it trickle a little bit, you know. <laughs> I was doing my thing. Uh, I had already been on tour buses. I had already been on the road a little bit. Uh, so I, w- I had my what, what's called people call getting your feet wet. I already had my feet wet. I was about knee deep at the time within the music industry. And like I said, it had been years uh, since I had cut my first demo. I had been to industry parties. I had uh, what's called the golden ticket. Uh, you know, I was I was in this on the spot. I was on the scene. And I, like I said, I, I mentioned to you before how I cut my first demo from. Uh, putting the cassette players together and stuff, stuff like that, and stereos, and going to industry parties and really um, passing myself out as a, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, uh, as a marketer, you know, that I was my own marketer um, because I, I was a producer, I was <laughs> I was the designer, I mean art design, I was the engineer, I was the, the, the songwriter, I had did everything all by myself. You know, I, I was the uh, I was the direct salesman. <laughs> I, I I did everything myself. I was a distributor. I boxed and practiced that stuff. I mean, it was all done artisan style by hand. All right, and uh, with a pair of scissors, glue tape, uh, cassette tapes, and uh, Windows 95. Word processor, all right, so Windows 97 or something like that, anyway. And so I made it do what it do. And so when I met these individuals, that's who I was. You know, I didn't have a big fancy name like that. Uh, I had already uh, gotten guys on the radio, as I wrote down in, uh, in my. You can find that in the book, the Radio Ready Report. You get this as a part of that course. If you had not had the time to read that yet, go ahead and get over to it. Um, I don't know how the audio version is coming to that book, um, but it could be attached at this point. Um, I really don't know how that process is going. I have someone to help me out with that study, my buddy study. <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with him uh, by now, so we'll see how he's going, uh, how he's doing with that. Um, and so my point is this: is that uh, I was already established, uh, establishing myself or had established myself as an artist slash uh, the upcoming producer. And uh, that I knew for sure because I had already had my feet wet. Like I said, I was about knee deep in, uh, in the midst of what was, it, what was going on in the Atlanta scene uh, during this time of year. It was about 2005, 2006, somewhere in between those years. So anyhow, um, when they, that's when they first met me. And so over the years, like I said, that that blew up with me exponentially because I had already had contacts, I already had been on the road, I had already worked for a record label, um, I had already been, had uh, shows, I already been on TV, things of that nature. So it was started to grow as I went out more and more and made more contacts and met more people and did more 
you know, you do, do your thing over a period of time. I'm going to teach you how to do the exact same thing on your level uh, and cut a lot of that fluff out of there. So I've, I've already walked through the mud and the muck and the mire, so to speak, right? And anyhow, these particular guys, uh, they had a home studio. And um, actually, they, they hadn't had a home studio. They had uh, a mom who had cut a couple of tracks before, helped somebody out, so she was familiar. And so it actually, her and I were really the associates. And so I found out through her that uh, her son, uh, were doing the same thing, or some people who would come over from uh, to see her were interested in the same thing, so to speak. And so here's what happened. Over a period of time, uh, as I began to grow as an artist, as a producer, as an engineer, as a, you know, getting my feet, not getting my feet wet anymore, so now I'm swimming in it. You know, I've, I've met major artists. I've been in their homes. I've been in their studios. I've worked for them. I've worked on their projects. I, they've worked on my projects. Etc. So uh, now I'm I have been established as an independent. I'm not signed to a label. I didn't sign a record deal. Um, uh, I spoke to you uh, in a previous message about me turning down a couple of record deals uh, because I wanted my leverage. Um, if you haven't got that message, go back and check it out when you get a chance. Anyhow, uh, so it was beneficial for me to make my own money. So now I was working as an established independent in uh, major studios and with major artists, people who have Grammy winners, uh, who are Grammy winners, who have been nominated for awards, and so people that you would typically see on TV or uh, could read about if you had not known about it. But, you know, a lot of the backstage people who don't have a big name, but they have a lot of big pool in the industry, and that's the way it goes. A lot of times the people who have really big names actually have no leverage, no pool. The studio owns their brand, and so I was talking and had learned how to associate myself with brand winners. I'll just call that, we'll call it, we'll staple that label to this course, a brand winner. All right, and that's what this session is about, teach you how to be a, a brand winner. So see if, pay close attention to what I'm about to reveal to you because you will learn uh, before this uh, less particular res lesson is out how to be a brand winner. And so anyhow, I had uh, established myself as an independent among brand winners. And I myself was becoming a brand winner. And um, a period of time went by, and these uh, few guys who would stop by, they all kind of collected together. Uh, and over a time, the, the lady, she built a studio within our home, and I would come over from time to time just to consult and see how things are going and whatnot. And so I started to get mixed into what they were doing somehow. I don't remember how. Maybe it was just kind of, you know, uh, cross-pollinization, like I said. And so I never had them work on anything for me, and they never... Uh, I never worked on any of their stuff, but some kind of way, I, every time I would go over there, I would, since they had better speakers, I think that was, yeah, I think, I, something like that. Um, the, the particular guy, he had a lot, that's what it was. Before I started engineering for real uh, and went to school for it, he would, like, tinker around with mixers and things of that nature, so I needed an engineer so I could stay up on my, my production game. I needed an engineer uh, so I could step on my production game. So I didn't have time to learn how to engineer. I wanted someone to work with me, just like um, uh, a lot of the, the, the major guys I saw or the independent major guys I saw within the studio. They were the producers or the composers, and they had engineers. So I needed someone to do that because I didn't have time to work the board. This is before I started working the board professionally. And um, that's how I got kind of mixed into what they were doing. I would come over to uh, check on the lady who was an, an artist. She was a, 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 a singer and a talented one. She had traveled the country, you know, singing and whatnot. And um, here was a, they had more access to equipment. That's what it was. Uh, and my equipment at the house at the time was limited. And I wasn't doing any shows at the time, and so I just said, let me start getting back into my home studio game. And so I would go over to check on her, and then I would fall into what they were doing. And while they were there, I just started to say, hey, uh, well, this and that. You know, give certain tips and tell them about who uh, I had been around and what I had seen of professional guys do who were, you know, much larger than both of us. You know, just try to give them tips here and there. 
And I think how it turned out is that they didn't believe it, so I would begin to bring over uh, certain CDs, certain things that I had done, certain projects, and, then, you know, they'd start to get this. I did like, whoa, this guy is very serious about who he is. You know, I didn't know he was this type of dude. Uh, and so from time to time it went on, you know, here and there as I would check on um, check on her and come over and, and visit her or whatnot. Um, is that we've developed a friendship over time, uh, so to speak, not, uh, more like a uh, a friendly ship, not a friendship, a friendly ship. And anybody who's ever had associates understand what they, that means. And so I would kind of associate with them when they were sitting in the, uh, the studio and they would ask my opinion about this and about that, and I would sh- uh, kind of A, B track for them. And I'd come over and play some stuff that I had done with uh, a major label artist, and, uh, you know, let them hear the mix and see, get their opinion on certain things. And, you know, just kind of uh, cross-pollinization with them, like I said. And uh, they started to get uh, really jealous. And one time I came over and I brought a, 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 a song that I had done with an artist uh, who was signed to Master P label, uh, No Limit Records. And this is around uh, that, that at that time. And... Um, one of the guys behind the board, he was an upcoming producer, um, I don't know whatever happened, and I, I think I checked on him a couple of years back, he never did do anything big, but he had a potential to be a producer, uh, a beat maker, or at least a, a junior beat maker, you know, who could work for someone, he had some potential, and he said to me, like, very, very snidely, if you're so big, why do you keep coming around here? And, that, like, everybody got quiet. And so it kind of revealed the situation to itself. And I said, I come around here because I like you guys. And so that made them feel really bad, you know. And so after that, I withdrew my hand from that studio because I said, listen, um, I don't want to be around people who don't want to be around me. I had already learned, like I said, I learned these things I'm telling you now, that I don't have time to waste with you. If you don't need me around you, if we can't cross pollinization, if we can't do a little shop talk, if we're all producers, engineers, and uh, upcoming artists, if you don't want to be around someone who's more knowledgeable than you to help you out, to short, help you shortcut your ways, and not trying to change your ways, but help you uh, with what you what you want to do in life, then guess what? I don't want to be around you either. So I withdrew my head from the studio, and so after that, the studio fell under. And one of the guys from the group came out and reached out to me and said, man, I wish I remember that uh, when that happened. And he said, um, I, I've always wanted to just go over there and hang out with, at your studio. And so they, uh, eventually he he come over and visit my studio and uh, talk about how he wanted this and that type of track from me. And I said, listen, I can help you, um, but you're going to have to, like, disassociate yourself from what you're doing. And I didn't mean any of his friends or anything. I didn't even mean any of those people. Um, I'm just, I was just straight up telling the guy, like, hey, if you you got to rebrand yourself as an artist. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. You're going to be pretty much spinning your heels um, in the mud. And so he did. But um, And I helped him out on a project I did. I helped him do his first um major project and here's what I'm telling you um, we spent a lot of time um, in the studio crafting um, his particular sound um, helping him work on his vocals helping him work on his uh, his persona as an artist helping him to um, become the person that he needed to be in order to um, transition as a new kind of artist and so um, he was kind of like a, one of those singing singing rappers type of guys you know and um, and so I helped him understand this, this sound I had been working with uh, with Lil John, and I had been working with uh, uh, certain guys I worked with um, uh, uh, what, what was the guy's name Soldier Boy uh, engineer and so I worked with guys who were working with um, um, Young Jeezy and things of that nature, and so I was familiar with the types of tricks people would uh, do in the studio to get produce a certain sound. When a guy didn't have that type of sound, it was like a template they would use and it was already created uh, to help shape somebody's sound or sh- shift them into a new dimension 
of um, production. And so I showed him some of the, 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 the secrets that I knew, some of them, not all of them. And he would um, take these, these tracks back to his own studio. And so eventually, like I said, that whole thing with him fell under uh, because they found out he began working with me and his group fell apart and whatnot. And so I helped him. I said, listen, uh, since uh, you guys get, couldn't get a deal, I'm going to show you how to get a deal. Uh, and so he split from them and went full-time as a solo artist. And like I said, I helped him develop that first album from beginning to end, the entire sound. In fact, I gave him two tracks off of there that were made for uh, independent major artists, uh, or groups, excuse me. Uh, they're called Drop Zone. Drop Zone in Atlanta is, is, is uh, I don't know how Drop Zone is doing these days, but back in the, during the mid-2000 era, late um, 2010, like around the, the last decade, should I say, they were all in the clubs, they were everywhere, okay, all over Atlanta, I don't know how far they reached out, I could probably ask the, the, uh, the owner, I know him personally, um, we Facebook from time to time, you know, I don't really keep up with him, he doesn't really keep up with me, but we know each other personally, so it's just a matter of phone call or a text or something like that, he'll tell me what's up. Uh, anyway, if you could, you could check them out, maybe they're on Facebook somewhere, anyhow, uh, but they, I made tracks for them uh, because I was in their studio every weekend, uh, and they had it going on, trust me. And so I, had, I gave this particular guy who had switched his sound their tracks. And so um, this kept uh, two things. This, this did two things for me. One, it I honored my word. But two, I had to break off a relationship with other people that I do because it kept uh, Drop Zone off of the radio. These two tracks that I gave them were radio-ready tracks. And there's a secret to that, um, but I'll tell you why I did this. Um, and I'll explain to you momentarily why I did this. But uh, the, the tracks that I gave them... tracks that I gave him were radio ready tracks. That means they were built specifically and tracked out and tuned and, and edited specifically for um, an artist uh, I believe his name at the time. He may have changed his name since then. But he was a, a kid artist called Young Young Icky. Icky. That's, I think it was I-K-K-I or Y or something like that anyway. But he was a young boy who was in the club already. He had been on television. I mean, this dude was nice. You understand what I'm saying? And I, he had two radio cuts for me. They were ready to go. And this is one of the reasons why I pulled out of the drop zone as a uh, as a, the head producer and engineer is because of um, when they presented to me the deal um, and the talks with the owner. Like I said, I know him personally. This is nothing between me and him. You know, um, you know, people will get hot for a minute, but I mean, there, there's no, you know, bad blood or anything like that. Uh, at least I hope it's not, because I, it wouldn't come for me. <laughs> but I mean, they, they, they went on and they still do their thing. Don't get me wrong. And um, I pulled out because this was his son, and he wanted to retain the rights, all the rights for that, and just kind of uh, throw me a piece of the bone. And like I said, I had by this time I already went through college already kind of understood contracts, already, you know, been around different celebrities and whatnot to see how the way they handle business, uh, the end of the studio thing, and I just straight up told them, no deal, I need a, um, I need my leverage. If you don't have leverage in a contract, we'll get to contracts maybe later, um, but particularly, we probably just brush over it. Contracts are really not necessary uh, within your home studio business if you're dealing with your own crew. Now, I'll tell you why they are necessary. It's simply because uh, you will need you will need to um, you will need to clarify some things with your group about who's in charge and uh, if anything happens as far as money is concerned, uh, how that's going to be split up between you guys. So, other than that. Uh, contracts are really not necessary. Um, 
So anyhow, my, my point is to say all that is this, is that being on the wrong platform uh, can, get, can, can uh, really do hazard, do a hazard or do you a uh, deficiency to your business. And I keep calling it a business because you're, you need to start thinking about yourself as a brand. You need to be start thinking about yourself and your skills, your talents, your abilities, that even if you're trying to get some, that you're doing it for a reason. You're not just doing it just to hang out um, at the house and show everybody what you can do. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, but I mean, at the end of the day, there comes a point in time after you've sharpened the steak or sharpened the knife so much that you have to go cook. And then when you get to cook, you don't just cook just to present a, a dish and take a picture of it. Yeah, you might do that, but your point to cook is to eat. And your point to eat is to be full. And your point to be full is to have energy for your body. And your point to have energy for the body is to live. And your point to live is to have experience, okay? And I'm not going to repeat that. Just go back and, uh, and listen to what I just said. And that's the whole point of you doing music is that um, it first needs to be... Um, a study as to um, what you need to know where you want to go with it, all right? Know where you want to go with it. And once you know where you want to go with it, you know what you want to do with it. And once you know what you want to do with it, you'll begin to uh, understand uh, the dynamics of what you need to do. And then once you understand what you need to do, then you'll begin to produce results. And then when you produce a result, of course, you need to be compensated for that result. And you're point in making music, I'll just give it to you if you don't even know, so if you don't have one, your point in making music, composing music, singing music, playing music, recording music, is to make other people um, uh, happy. People listen to music to be happy. They don't listen to music to be sad. Yeah, there's songs that are sad, and there's songs that have, are melancholy, and there's songs that... Um, that uh, that that kind of you know get you angry and stuff. But the point of the song is really to to relate to the person uh, how they should feel about the situation. And the person listens to that song because it puts them in a state of mood that they want to be in. They want to feel tough. They want to feel rough. They want to feel pumped up. They want to feel uh, happy. They want to feel they want to feel uh, in love. And so that's your point in doing that, is to making that type of music. Now, hopefully you're not, you know, making music that's derogatory and, you know, things of that nature. I mean, let's move past that, people. Everybody uh, has done songs about that. But, I mean, you don't need to be... Look, listen, I'm not going to give you a lecture on what type of music. You want to make music, make whatever kind of music you want to make. But what I'm telling you is that um, have some character, have some integrity, and know where you want to go with any music and your point. Especially if you're a male, you don't need to be making songs like that about females, okay? Uh, but if you do, you know, I'm going to show you how to make some money off of it. But my point is saying that is this, is that uh, people will listen to your music, and definitely uh, if you're making songs like that, you know what kind of songs I'm talking about, about females, they won't buy your records. Go read the Radio Ready Report when I talk about it in Part 3, Finding the Hook. Uh, about finding out who your demographic is and how to uh, market to them, and especially if you're making songs, uh, women are. I'll just expose this to you, since this is coming down from the mastermind, the intersector course, uh, to information to you and going out to them, is that you already know that uh, women buy most of the thing. They control 85%. In fact, the last time I checked, it was a few years ago. They control 85% of the nation's wealth. Okay. Now, with the recent collapse of this economy, that means pretty much the ball is in the women's court right now to bring back the economy. All right. The economy just collapsed. It, it, it crushed it, and um, Donald Trump closed it down. Uh, people are sinking into debt. People, oh, we don't want to talk about that. All right. But the ball is now in the ladies' court. All right. Now, if you go and make some songs like what uh, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg used to make back in the day and do all those type of videos, you already uh, can consider hanging yourself. All right, it's over with for you, buddy. Because let me tell you what, women control now the nation's wealth, and so you want to begin to try to market, ladies. Hello, can we stand up, please, and say uh, amen? All right, thank you. So listen, if you want to start making music, you want to start figuring out how to market to the ladies. And women, you already know what to do, so I'm not going to go there, but you get, I'm going to show you how to uh, work and operate in a man's world.
um, and that's going to make you a lot stronger. So I'm talking to you, right? And so my point is this, this saying this to you, is that um, being in the wrong arena could really uh, ruin your opportunities. And so um, I took that <clears throat> I took that track, those two tracks, from the drop zone, which were ready for the radio. It was ready for a uh, uh, station in Atlanta, uh, uh, hot Atlanta. I don't remember the name of the station right now, so don't give me a line. I called a couple out, but I could be wrong. Uh, so, but anyway, it was ready for the radio. And um, I took the track back from them uh, because they didn't want to give me my entire leverage, which I commanded, I demanded, and I uh, still obtained. And um, I gave it to the single individual artist because he had signed with me as my, uh, my, my art- artisan. I was his manager now, and he was my artist. And so um, I produced, I was executive producer. I had control of this entire project. But I promised him a 50-50 split. But I, I maintained control of my rights to all the stuff. So I mean, I own everything, but I would split the sale with him. And so anyway, what happened was this. Um, uh, I took those tracks from the drop zone. They didn't get on the radio. Um, I pulled, I gave it to uh, this particular artist. Um, we went into the studio, recorded his album, his first album, from, from finish to end. I produced the whole thing. Um, people were calling me over the phone, telling me, asking me what's happening with the tracks, why are they not getting their tracks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, me and this particular artist, we went out and we did a show. I got him his first real live venue. This is a paid venue, uh, first time he ever did a paid venue. I think he had did some open mics or something like that, and, and uh, I don't know if he got cheered or booed, I don't know what happened, um, but he had never had an experience where he was getting paid to do a live show, and so I talked to him over and over again, I said, hey, you got to do this show like this, you got to be ready, you got to be ready, you got to be ready, people are working out, let me tell you something, what artists do, real life artists do, they work out in the gym to their songs. They rap while they're working out. They sing while they're working out so they can have stamina, energy, and so forth to uh, to bring the, the song to life to you. Now, guess what happened? Um, it kept leading up to the day he was getting ready to do the venue. It kept leading up to the day, kept leading up to the day, kept leading up to the day. And um, what ended up happening is this, is that he got to the venue and was completely off key. He was out of tune, out of breath. Um, he had not even rehearsed his own lyrics, so he didn't know how to sing his own song. And guess what? At the end of the day, when I looked at the promoter, he had to pay me. And, yeah, it was the first show. Your first show is always going to be pretty bad. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. They're always going <laughs> always to be kind of bad. But this, was, in my opinion, was horrendous. I had too much experience to let this happen to me. And so I realized that I... Guess what? Was under the wrong kind of uh, platform with the wrong type of people. And uh, he soon realized that he had done the same, is that he was not ready for the, the, for the big time. He was not ready to uh, be an artist, uh, getting paid, doing shows, uh, having people know his name. He just wanted to be a home studio artist, being on the block, um, talking to the guys, you know, playing it on the, the, the speaker, the Ticker Twelves or the Super Blues, whatever you got in your trunk. You know, he wanted to play his music loud uh, in the JBC back in his mom's studio. And he wanted to pull up at work playing his own music, but he wasn't ready to be a real-life artist like those who were at the drop zone. And so guess what? We, all, we both learned a lesson that day is that we were both hanging around the wrong people. I was hanging around him, who was not ready to go somewhere as an artist, and he was hanging around me, who was already a professional and was looking for other professional people to work with. And so guess what happened? That relationship dissolved very quickly. The album was released, um, but all of his, 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 um, his requests that people called me for, I shut it down. I took all the rights back to... I took all the rights back into um, the production that was made. I took every cent that was made. I folded the project up, and I archived it. 
it was never released. There was a double CD made. Um, a lot of promises was made. And it never came to anything. I never made my money back on it. And there were thousands spent. Thousands spent. That I never made back. And I was going to re-release the project. Um, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to cut my losses here. I'm going to cut my losses. I'm going to cut them big time. And that's what I did. And that's what I want to tell you today. Is that how marketing is is in the plan here. But you have to first know who you are, what you're going to do, and what you're going to do about it. You have to know whether you're for real or you're for fake. All right? And that guy thought he was for real, but he was for fake. Well, I was for real, and I didn't know he was for fake. I just thought he needed some help. You have to know And so that's one thing. We didn't know about each other. So you have to know that about yourself before you begin to market yourself. You already know whether you're for real or for fake. But guess what? You're not for fake because you're here in this course. You're here talking to me. You're here listening to me. I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. We're in the same bucket together. And guess what? That's why I'm here. I'm here to help for real people. I'm here to help people who want something out of life. And if that's you, this is all the time I have for now. We'll discuss this a little later. This has been Terry Wilburn, your friend. I'll let you soon.